guys, it's Courtney. Today I'm going to be using an older stamp set by MFT called Saddle Up and Celebrate. I'm going to be creating a one layer scene here and I'm going to kind of take you through the process that I have anyway <laughs> of creating a one layer scene. So I have all of my masks pre-cut here and I just roughly put them onto my panel here to get a rough idea of how I want things to see if there's any empty spaces. If there is, I can fill it in with an additional stamp or an image, or I can draw something in. In this case, I'm going to do both. So I'm going to take two of the images from the Sweet Succulent stamp set, and this is also by MFT, to kind of fill in some blank spaces that I had on either side. So now that I have an idea of how I want everything, I'm going to go ahead and use my Misty to make it easier for you guys to kind of follow along. Again, I'm going to take all of my masks and place them down to get an idea. Now, I'm using Simon Says Stamp Masking Paper, which has a backing to it. I plan on doing some ink blending in the background, so I want something that's super tacky. So it's not going to necessarily lay flat with that backing still on it. So I can't line it up perfectly, but I can get an idea of which images I need to stamp first. Any image that you want to be in front of another, you're going to want to stamp and mask first and then kind of move your way back from there. So my first images, I thought, were going to be my little boy and girl and the cake. But once I had everything lined up, the outer edge of the stamp, I guess, where the the polymer kind of goes beyond the image itself, if that makes any sense to you guys, um, made it so that I couldn't stamp all three at one time. So I'm going to start off with the cake. I'm going to center that into my onto my card panel, and I want to make sure that I have enough room for this little wheel thing underneath it, because I want this wheel to be resting on the table that the cake is on. So I'm going to go ahead and stamp out that image, making sure that I have enough room for everything else I want to add. And I'm going to be stamping with Blackout Ink by Ink on 3 because this is a Copic Safe ink. And I use the grids, the grid lines on my Misty 2 just to make sure that it is completely straight. Just because it's straight to the eye doesn't mean it is really straight. <laughs> so I use that. You'll see that every once in a while I'll kind of flip the lid of the, or the, door of my Misty to just kind of make sure everything's lined up. So I'm going to go ahead and stand, or mask out my cake there and then I'll move on to my little boy and my little girl and I'm just kind of making sure that their feet are around the same height from the bottom of the card panel to make sure it looks like as if they're standing on straight ground. Also going to stamp my middle balloon. I plan on using three and I want the middle one to be in front of the other. So I'm going to stamp that first. Again, inking that, those up and stamping those down and then I'll mask those out as well. Now as far as your masks go, I use a ton of different masks. Simon is probably my favorite. Well, it is my favorite, um, but I do have another video from a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago that I'll link below that kind of goes over the different types of masking that I use in a little bit more detail. But when you're cutting masks, when you're doing ink blending in the background, you want to make sure they're as perfect as you possibly can get it. So usually with MFT stamps, their lines on their images are pretty... Um, pretty fine. They're not real thick lines. So you just want to be careful to cut right along those black lines. Even though the masking paper that I'm using is very thin, once you take off that backing, it's still going to raise up from the page a little bit. So you have to take that into consideration depending on what type of masks you're using. Okay, so here I am stamping the succulents, or in this case, I'm using them as cactus. I think that's pretty much the same thing anyway. Um, this little wheel and my second balloon. I'm going to go ahead and mask those out and finally stamping out this third and final balloon that will appear to be a little bit behind that middle one. I'm going to go ahead and mask that out as well, making sure that all of my images are as lined up as I possibly can get them before I do any of my ink blending. So for my background, I'm going to keep the background pretty simple, but first I want to make sure that I draw in my little table. 
Now, I don't have a whole lot of room to work with here, so it doesn't have to be perfect, but I always go in with my pencil first. I am not an artist by any means at all. <laughs> it doesn't take an artist to draw something like this. So just sketch it out with your pencil, erase it as you go along. You'll see that I erase a lot. Usually I edit that part out, but trust me, I use that eraser a lot. So I'm gonna make it appear as if there's a tablecloth on the table just so that I don't have to worry about drawing the table legs and making sure that the measurements are all lined up. I'm just kind of freehanding this. So once it's sketched out with my pencil, I'm gonna bring out my T-square ruler to make sure that my lines are completely straight and I'm going to use a Copic Safe pen. Now the first pen I used, the nib on it was just a little bit too thick in order to match my images, so I'm gonna bring out a little bit thinner of one to finish off that table. And I'm gonna make it appear as if this table's right behind my little girl and my little boy, so I don't have to worry about the corners or anything. Make it as simple as possible. Going to erase those pencil lines before I do my coloring or my ink blending, because once you color over it, you will not be able to get them up. So going to use a variety of distress inks here for my ground and my sky, but I'm not masking them out. I'm gonna kind of just let them blend together. I had a little bit of trouble with this mask, this little flower part of this cactus. So I'm just gonna peel that up a little bit and smudge on some Tombow Mono Multi Glue, let that dry, and then it's repositionable once it's dry. So that'll stick down fine. So here's where I forgot to mask out my table. So obviously I freehanded this. So I can't cut a mask for it. So I'm just using a full stick post-it note tape and kind of laying that down roughly <laughs> over the little table. So you can see that I'm kind of just peeling that up, cutting little pieces, and I'll even take a little bit of a strip just to kind of fill in that little blank area. I know that I'll have to take my Copic markers to fill in any gaps that I may have, but at least this will cover a majority of it because you don't necessarily want to use your Copics over Distress Oxides. I don't think it will damage your Copics, but you won't get a good result. They don't blend well. So for the bottom or for the ground, I'm going to be using Antique Linen and Frayed Burlap, just using the Frayed Burlap on the very bottom and then blending that out with the Antique Linen just to make this kind of look like sand desert like scene <laughs> then for the top portion of the card for the sky i'm going to start by using my tumbled glass which is my lightest color and i'm just going to put a light coating down over the entire thing and then i'm going to be using the salty ocean just for the very top and then blend that out a little bit with the stormy sky, which will significantly tone down that salty ocean. You can see that the salty ocean is very, very bright and vibrant. The stormy sky is not so much. It has more of a gray tone to it. So it will tone that down a little bit, but blends very nicely with that tumbled glass. So I'll bring that tumbled glass back in and I will go ahead and extend that almost to where my antique linen is. You can see that I'm inking this up a lot. Um, just because I wasn't getting great coverage, I think my ink pad is starting to go dry a little bit. I had a little bit of a disaster a few months ago where my entire shelf of Distress inks and Distress Oxide inks fell during the night and all of the caps came off. And so who knows how long the cap was off by the time I found it. So once my ink blending was done, I will let this dry for about five minutes because the Distress Oxides do stay wet longer and will get your masks wet. I lift up my masks with just the, the tip of the blades of the scissors to kind of get them going and then I'll peel them up with my fingers. I seem to have better luck with this, especially when I have an ink blended background. Occasionally your masks may tear your paper as you're removing them. So I find that using just the blade of the scissors to kind of get it started prevents this most of the time and letting your ink dry for just a little bit before you remove those masks. So just going to remove these remaining masks, and you can see that I do have a few areas where I may have a little bit of a white outline around my masks where they weren't totally covering up my image perfectly or weren't cut perfectly. And then there's a gap between his little legs and underneath that one arm that I just didn't want to cut a mask for. So I'm bringing out my Copic chart here to kind of line that up 
with the background to pick a marker or pick a color that very closely matches the rest of the background wherever I need to fill in those areas. And I can just move this around over these little hexagons. Um, I use the hex chart by Sandy Allnock and I think it's probably saved a ton of my cards just for the pure convenience of it. So I'm also going to take that EK Success journaling pen to go over the balloon strings as well. Once you go over those with the Distress Oxides, they're more opaque, so you kind of lose that bold black line. So next we're going to move on to the coloring, and you're going to see that I have this sped up a lot. <laughs> because if I didn't, this video before I sped this up was going to be 42 minutes long. And I don't expect you guys to sit here for 42 minutes and I can't talk for 42 minutes. So I have this sped up a lot. If you don't want to see the coloring and you just cared about the scene building, then pretty much all I do is just add a sentiment at the end. Um, but I'm starting with my skin tones as always, using the same color combination for each one of these two, but I'm just adding a little bit more of the darker colors to his face, concentrating on either side of her face and then more to the right side of his, our right, his left, um, just because he's kind of faced towards the middle. I'm using a little bit more dark on him just to make him a little bit darker than she is so that they're not the exact same color adding a little bit of the R20 for their cheeks and then blending that back out with the lightest color. For his hair, I'm going to just use some E50 markers. There's not much room here. He only has a few little strands of hair sticking out from underneath his hat. So honestly, you probably don't have to do any blending at all here, but I just did a little bit to get a little bit of contrast. For her hair, I wanted to make her hair more of kind of like a dirty blonde, I guess. So I'm going in first with my darkest color. I always add my darkest color first when I color hair. I just find that it gives more of a, not I don't want to say a realistic look, but it gives you more texture to the hair because you kind of maintain those flick lines. Once that E18 was done or down, I am going to add the E15, then go over the entire thing with a Y26. That'll kind of brighten everything up. Now her little pigtails are kind of wavy, so I'm just adding some shading where they're kind of indented in, where the wavy lines are, and that will give some more texture to her hair and still kind of keep that wavy look that she's got going on. Next, I will move on to their little cowboy hats here, and I'm just gonna show you her cowboy hat because I used the same color combination and pretty much shaded everything the same way for each one of them. I'm laying out my lightest color to map out the darkest areas, then going in with the E37. Just gonna add a little bit of shading where it's kind of tucked behind her head. And on the top portion, it's gonna be some shading on either side because it's a rounder object. Also, it's kind of indented on the very top, so I'm using that to my advantage too to kind of add some shading and add some dimension there as well. Blending that out each time with the mid-tones and then back to that lightest color. Again, colored their both of their hats, or the hat on him and the hat on the little cake, the same way. Just put a little bit more shading to the right-hand side for him. Like I said, he's kind of facing towards the middle. I'm going to be using the same color combination, the E30s, for a lot of their clothing as well. And I just left this in here so that you can kind of see where I put the shading for each one of them. I do, totally off the subject, but I do want to apologize for having big band-aids on my hand. About two minutes before I pressed record, I was just finishing up, you know, cutting my masks and getting my stamp sets ready and things like that. And my cat, Macy, decided to throw a little bit of a temper tantrum. And she's a little bit, she can be a little mean sometimes. So out of nowhere, she'll be snuggling and purring. And then all of a sudden, she'll hit you, claws out. So I didn't think you guys would want to see what's underneath those band-aids. So that was the only way that I could really cover it up and not gross you guys out. So I'm just finishing up their little vests and jackets and boots there and going in with that lightest color just for the highlight and for their little shirts underneath their vest there's not much room or not much of these showing so I want these to appear white but I'm just going to be adding some shading with my gray markers I am leaving just a teeny tiny bit of white 
left, but anything white still has shading to it, still has shadows. So for his little jeans, or his pants, I'm making them jeans, I'm going to bring out some B90 markers. And as always, starting off with that lightest color to map out those darkest areas. Again, these darkest areas will be off to the right-hand side, being he's faced towards the left. I'm also putting little tiny flick lines where his one leg is bent there and where his pants are kind of gathered together towards the bottom where they're laying over his boots just to add a little bit more dimension there, blending that out each time with the mid-tones and then just reserving that highlight towards the right-hand side for that B93. Now for their little scarves, I guess they would be, around their necks, I wanted to bring in some red, and typically I save my reds to last, but being they're pretty much colored, I feel safe enough to add the red to these little scarves or bandanas or whatever they are. So again, going in with my lightest color to map out the darkest areas, then moving on to the darkest color. Now there are some lines or flicks within the illustration that kind of shows you where the fabric would be gathered together. I'm using those to my advantage to add some shading. And this way, once everything is said and done, you'll still remain, you'll still maintain those little flick lines in the image. And this kind of just guides you as far as where to add some shading. And you'll notice a big difference if you use these to your advantage. So blending the rest of that out with the R22, also did her little, colored her little hair bands there with red too to just make that red pop a little bit more. Colored in their belts, I didn't do any shading here just because there's no room to really do any shading, and the Y26 for their belt buckle to kind of make it look gold. Now for the middle tier of this cake, I am going to bring out those E30s again just to add a little bit of shading on either side and maintaining a center highlight. Now for the tiers on the cake itself, I want these to appear white. So again, bringing out those C markers, adding a little bit of shading on either side of the tier because this is a round object, the highlight would be in the center, and also adding a little bit of shading on the base of each of the tiers where they are kind of behind the tier below it, if that makes sense. Blending that out with the C3 and then finally the C1, making sure that I leave a little bit of white. I do take my colorless blender just to kind of get rid of some of those harsh lines. You'll want to make sure that the colorless blender is completely dry before you move on to the next step. So for the little spots on the bottom tier, I am using my black, my C7 and C5, but I'm also paying attention to the shape of the cake. So if the, these spots are towards the edges, I'm coloring those in a little bit dark darker and for that middle spot there that's going to be the lightest same thing for the balloons Just doing some shading on either side of these balloons with the c5 c3 and c1 using that colorless blender to get rid of those harsh lines and these balloons kind of reminded me of the ones that are not that you can't see through so i didn't bother to add any kind of reflection that you would normally see in a balloon i just maintained a center highlight for each of them because they are round objects and i didn't bother to do any shadows either where one is hanging over another doing the spots on these or coloring the spots on these the same way as i did with the cake if it's a center one it's naturally going to be just a little bit lighter than the ones on either side center highlight all round objects will have a center highlight so once my balloons were done i'm going to bring in some e50s and i'm going to go right in with my darkest color because the lines or the amount of space that i have to work with on this little wheel thing is very minimal so i want to try to avoid as much bleeding as i can so i'm going to go in with my darkest color then my mid-tone and then finish off with the e55 i'm only using three colors just because I don't need a whole lot of shading on this particular object. If I do have any bleeding, I'm not too concerned because I'm going to bring out those reds again, which are significantly darker than the R than the E30s. I use the E37, I think I use just for the base of the, uh, the cake. Even though it looks like grass, I didn't want to color it green. So again, for this little tablecloth, going to bring in my lightest color to get those darkest areas mapped out. The back of the table will naturally be darker than the front of the table where the cake is lying, but there also will be a shadow underneath the cake. Going to add some shading on 
just one side of the little spokes of the wheel. It doesn't really matter what side, I just picked a side. Also creating some triangles on the bottom portion of the tablecloth and this will kind of make it look like it's kind of pleated or folded in a little bit on the bottom. And I'm barely just touching the tip of the marker to the paper to create these triangles with the darkest color because this is a really super dark red. I don't wanna to add too much of it. I'm gonna go in with the R46 and I'm gonna start blending all of these areas out, including those triangles. All I'm really doing with these triangles is making them a little bit wider and a little bit taller. Now, some of them are kind of hanging behind that spoke or that, I'm sorry, that wheel. I'm not concerned with that, trying to make it show through. I don't wanna mess anything up. So I'm just gonna mainly have those two on either side that you can clearly see. Extending all those areas out with the R27, including those triangles, bringing them almost up to the top of the table. And then finally, I will go back in with that R22 and blend all of these areas out. Now, if it's not perfectly blended, I'm leaving it because reds bleed a lot. And once they bleed, you can't take them up. So I'm okay with not getting a perfect blend as long as I don't have any bleeding. So next we'll move on to the cactus on either side and I'm gonna bring out some G markers naturally. And again, these are kind of round, so I'm going to create my center highlight for these as well, starting off with the lightest color, then moving on to the darkest, the two mid-tones, and back to the lightest color. Pretty much the same thing as I've been doing, just obviously a different color combination. Now the one on the right looks very similar, and I'm sure my mom is going to watch this and think the same thing. Looks very similar to one that my cousin, when we were little kids, he decided to try to pick up. And I can remember my grandparents sitting in the bathroom pulling out all the little pricker things from his hand for hours. So they are sharp. Be careful. <laughs> so just finishing up with the lightest color here in the center and then the little flowers. I'm going to color these in solid just because I just don't feel like doing any shading. They're teeny tiny areas. So I am going to add some shadows with my C markers underneath each of these objects, including the cactus, even though they wouldn't necessarily cast a shadow. I just wanted to keep things consistent. And then I'm going to add some details to my images. So first I'm going to take that EK Success journaling pen and kind of go over the little frayed pieces of her little skirt there and her his little, um, well, I can't think of the word, whatever is on the side of his pants there, um, as well as the cacti where I went over it with the Distress inks. Next, I'm going to bring in my white gel pen just to add some detail and some reflections to most of these objects here. And you'll see that even if your coloring is not perfect or you don't get perfect shading, just adding a little bit of a reflection or a highlight on anything with a white gel pen as long as you go in the direction of the object so in the same shape as the object does add a lot of detail and really really makes them pop so once all of that was done i'm going to go ahead and stamp my sentiment with black dye ink by simon says stamp and i do have a little smudge here that i don't know whether you guys can see on camera so i'm going to stamp this directly over it and that will kind of disguise it a little bit Last, I wanted to add some detail or some texture to the sand. So I'm gonna bring out those E30 markers again and I'm just adding little dots to either side of my card panel, kind of closer together towards the edge and then kind of spreading them out as I move towards the center or, to yeah, towards the center of the card panel. I'm gonna use that E37, E33, and E31. And this just adds a little bit something extra to the ground. But that is it, guys. That's the card for today. Thanks a lot for stopping by and have a great day.